Edwin Grimsley. I'm a case analyst at the Innocence Project in New York. Um, at the Innocence Project, what we do is we free innocent people from prison through DNA testing and try to reform the system so that uh, wrongful convictions do not occur again. A uh, quick background of uh, how we work is pretty much you people write to us from prison, they say they're innocent. We have a long backlog, so pretty much since 1995, we've had 45,000 people actually write to us say they're innocent. You know, that's a lot, large amount of people. So we're pretty much what we do is we investigate their case. We want to see if they're innocent and if there's DNA to prove they're innocent. So we only take DNA uh, cases. Um, other projects around the country, and there's now actually 55 innocence projects around the country um, that get people out of, out of prison, some with non-DNA and DNA. Um, up to the current point, there's been 301 non-DNA uh, exonerations around the country and about 900 roughly non-DNA exonerations around the country. So that breaks it up to about 1,200 wrongful convictions out there. There could be anywhere to thousands and thousands more um, because DNA is actually only available in 5 to 10 percent of criminal cases. Um, we have to reject a lot of cases because of that. And sadly, they have to wait in prison. Um, pretty much what we do is we take their case. Um, we didn't look for the evidence. Um, pretty much evidence is stored usually in police departments, crime labs, in courts. Um, then we try to get testing on it, try to get the prosecutor to agree to it, um, and then it either to get the results back. And half the time, actually, the good news is when we actually find the evidence, it proves our guy did not do it. Um, and other times, it proves he did do it. Um, some of the causes of wrongful convictions are uh, eyewitness identification. 75% of the DNA exonerations are eyewitness IDs where a victim or witness misidentified um, or said um, the suspect or the person who was wrongfully convicted was the actual perpetrator when they weren't. 25% um, of the time is false confessions. Um, I know Raymond will speak a little bit about that in his case. Um, where the police either you know, coerce someone into confession, um, sometimes they're beaten, sometimes mentally ill, um, give false confessions. And so there's a litany of, of cases like that, the DNA exoneration has shown. 15% there's an informant of snitches that you know, where you know, someone is arrested on a separate crime and they bring them in um, and then they say that the, the, you know, most of the time you're very, um, I would say, biased in that they get deals, um, they cut deals, to actually snitch on someone else and say that they did it just to get out of prison. Um, and then other causes are, you know, prosecutors misconduct, not handing over files, the story goes on. Pretty much what we do is we try to reform the system um, fixing all of these avenues so that they don't occur again, um, and in also um, trying to also you know provide awareness to the public. You know, me and Raymond actually go around speaking to educate people about wrongful convictions so that you know everyone learns about it. This can happen to anybody. What you're seeing and do. Um, so I'll introduce Raymond Santana, um, who was you know uh, convicted in 1989, right? Of the Central Park Joggers case, um, and spent five years in prison, right? Seven, seven years of prison, sorry. Seven years of prison for his uh, wrongfully uh, conviction. It was overturned in 2002 um, after the DNA came back to um, another person, Mateus Reyes, um, who was the actual perpetrator of the crime. Um, I'm sure Raymond will talk about you know, what his case was about, his ordeal, and what it was like going through it. Uh, 
she had lost most of her blood. They didn't, uh, they didn't know if she was going to live. And so what happened was homicide detectives came in and they took over the case. And so at this point, we didn't know what was going on. We just thought that we were going to go to family court and that was going to be it. And, um, and so, uh, you know, we stood there through the night. And in the morning time, you know, detectives wanted to question us. But we didn't know why. We just figured it was because of some events that happened in the park that night. And uh, we got into the interrogation room and we were split up. It was about five of us at that time that were arrested together, but we were split up. And, um, and so it became the interrogation process. You know, when you see the video of us giving the, the statements, that's the finished product. What you don't see is the 15 to 30 hours that it took to reach that, that result. And so um, just like what you see in the movies, you know, you, or, or on TV, you see the good cop and the bad cop. Um, and, uh, 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 and, and people always have this question of, you know, the number one question is, how can you confess to something that you didn't do? And I tell them, I say, well, you know, first of all, you have to look at the age of an individual. If a kid is 14 years old, you know, he's already naive. He doesn't understand what happens in the system already. He doesn't understand police procedure. He doesn't even understand what random rights. And what happens is that you take that and you take into account a seasoned veteran officer who's been on the force 20 years, who uh, who knows the ins and outs of how to get you to say whatever he wants you to say. And then you have to throw in pressure. Pressure is like the most important ingredient because at first you'll start off and you say, oh, I didn't do anything. You know, I didn't see anything. But what happens is that after you've been in the room, you know, for 15 to 30 hours, and these officers, you know, they're pulling these tactics on you where they're yelling your face. Some of them even push you. Some of them even physically touch you. You know, you start to get afraid. And that's where the pressure starts to build because you don't know what's going to happen to you at that moment. You think that they can take you out back and kill you. Um, and so, you know, no parent, no food, no drink, no water, no lawyer. You don't understand what's going on. All you know is that you want to get out of that situation as quick as possible. And so, in the interrogation process, what happens is they start to wear you down. When they start to wear you down, mind you, you got to remember, you didn't have no food, no drink, no water. And when they start to wear you down, you just start to look for a way out. Once they break you down, they basically can get you to say whatever they want. And it's been on record, as, as, when, as he, he can tell you, it's been, on, it's been on record where you have men who have been over the age of 30 who have confessed to things that they have not done. And um, when you start to confess, you know, you, you don't really know what happened. We didn't know what happened, you know. In my case, I didn't know what happened. And, you know, all it took was for the officer to say, look, this is Kevin Richardson. Do you know him? And I said, no, I don't know him. He said, well, you see the scratch in his eye? That came from the woman. Well, you know he's going to jail forever. Now, I know you didn't do it because you're a good kid. That's not true. You come from a good household. I don't see you, you uh, being capable of committing a crime like this. So I'll tell you what, give me something to help me get him. And that's when the wheels start to turn. And so what happens is you go through that for several hours. They'll feed you the information. They'll tell you according to what they know. You know, what happened to Kevin Richardson? What happened to Antron McCray? What happened to Corey Wise? And all you do is start putting them and placing them within the story, which is all lies. And this is what happened to me. So what happened is, afterwards you had a full confession. And all you see on the result, all you see is the result is that finished product of me sitting in the chair telling you what happened. Because it's already been scripted, it's already embedded in my, in my brain after 30 hours of questioning. So, what happens after that is we get charged. And we still don't understand what's going on. You know, we just thinking, all right, I'm helping the police out, I'm going to go home, he said I was going to go home. So I gave him this story. I know the story's false. When it comes back, they'll know that I lied. But so what? I just want to get out of that situation right there, right now. And, um, and I got charged with raping the first, robbery the first, riot, assault, attempted murder on Patricia Miley. And um, it wasn't until I, I reached the prison that I said, wow, this is serious. Because now the whole jail wanted to do bodily harm to us. And, um, and so in this case, you know, Several months went by, and they took DNA evidence from us. So they took fingerprints, handprints, footprints. They took all of our clothes. 
and took hair samples, and they submitted all that. Now, DNA testing back then was very limited, but what they did was they sent it to the feds, and the feds took it, and they conducted all these tests. And after about a month or so, the test came back, and nothing matched. So here was Patricia Molly, they found in the bloody ravine, you know, she was dragged about, you know, 15, 30 yards, and it was, she was found in a pool of blood. But none of that was on us, and none of us was on her. Now, they found one semen sample was to one person, but they, it, didn't came from, it didn't come from the five of us. Now, if this was CSI, they would say, hold on, wait a minute, something's wrong here. None of this evidence matched these kids. Let's go back and reinvestigate. But they didn't do that. What they did was instead, they said, because we have a false confession, we're going to proceed to trial. <clears throat> and that's what they did with us. They proceeded to trial. And in the process, you know, the media ate it up. Within the first two weeks of this case, over 400 articles were written about us. And, um, and you know, and, and, and I think, and I say, wow, how can you write so much about a 14-year-old kid? Like, how can you dissect it so much? He hasn't even done anything yet. But that's what happened. And because of, though, because of the media attention and all the headlines that we received, the public started to already pass judgment on us. You know, they already started to assume that we was guilty. And so, when that starts to happen, and society as a whole coincides with the system, you really have no wins. It's only just a matter of time before you go to prison. But we didn't know that. We were still kids. We didn't understand that. And so when the DNA evidence came back, they proceeded to trial. And they put it out there. None of this physical evidence matched these kids. But because we made a, a confession, we was going to proceed to trial. And people always, you know, and people started to say, well, they confessed. If they confessed, they did it. Long story short, we went to trial and I blew trial. I received five to ten years for a crime that I didn't commit. Um, I went upstate and, you know, it was very hard for me because I was now labeled a sex offender, which means that I had to go through some type of sex offender counseling in prison. You know, sex offenders in prison do not match. They do not mix. You know, you become looked at as the, barrel of the, bar of the bottom of the barrel, which means that you have to make a decision very quick. You know, do you let somebody harm you at any time or do you stand up and fight for yourself? And that was a lesson that we had to learn overnight because of the media attention that we got from this case. I was released in 1995. I didn't know, you know, I figured, you know, all right, I get a fresh start, you know, I can have a chance to uh, pick up the pieces and move on with my life. But I had another thing coming. Uh, you know, being out there, I didn't know what to do. There was no transitional programs for me to make a smooth transition back into society and be productive. So I was just there. So that five to ten that they gave me really was a death sentence because I wasn't supposed to survive in prison and I wasn't supposed to survive out of society. I, I applied for numerous jobs. Nobody would hire me. And I didn't even understand that. Why won't you hire me? I'm trying to you know, do something right. And I had to look back and say, well, wait a minute. You're a sex offender. You know, you're a level three predator. You know, and you've been convicted of one of the most, according to Bear Cox, the crime of the century. Nobody's going to hire you. I filled out 10 applications, I got 10 rejections. And as a result, that lasted for about 10 months, 11 months. And I couldn't take it anymore. And um, because here I was, I was in my dad's house, and I was a bigger guy, so I ate a lot, and I couldn't contribute to the bills. I couldn't do anything, and I didn't know how to function. You know, I also came back from prison with all these prison-type characteristics. You know, I would wash my boxes in the, in, in, in a, in a, in a shower. Um, I couldn't be around a big group of people because I, I, you know, I felt uncomfortable. I had this pent up aggression in me. Um, even when I ate my food, I ate it in like five minutes quick. You know, I, and so uh, I like being in closed areas because it felt like a cell. And so all this stuff came down on me and I broke down. I couldn't, I couldn't handle it. And so what happened was I said, I got to do something. And what happened, I wound up selling drugs. I wound up selling drugs, and my house got raided. And um, when my house got raided, you know, uh, and I also got caught with drugs on me, and they charged me with a, 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 a criminal possession with the intent to sell. And that I was guilty of. And so when I went to court, I said, look, you know, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that my life is hard, you know, and that I couldn't get a job. All I'm going to tell you is that I'm guilty. Give me the least bit of time that I can get. And the judge offered me a three and a half to seven year sentence, and I took it, and I went back to jail. And so, 
Now I'm in jail, I'm in my fourth year. And um, I get this call from these investigators. And they want to talk to me about this old case. And I'm saying, well, why do you want to talk to me about that for? And they say, well, you know, we just want to change some of the, the juvenile laws. And I said, okay, fine. So I do an interview with them. And uh, I get back to my cell and I call my father. And I say, Dad, you know, they just called me about this old case and I don't know what's going on. So he says, well, I got something to tell you. Won't you sit down and grab a seat? And I say, okay, all right, what you got to tell me? And he says, you know, they found a person that committed your crime. And, and I'm saying, okay, you, you should, are you serious? And he says, yeah. And I say, yeah, okay, I, you know, I, I, whatever. And I was in so much denial and I was so institutionalized that I didn't even receive the good news. I figured they were going to take Mateus Reyes and make him the sixth man and I was going to keep this label of the Central Park Five on my back forever. And um, so what happened was, let me give you some background on Mateus Reyes. Mateus Reyes was known as the East Side Slasher. Um, two days before the rape of Patricia Miley in Central Park, he committed another rape on, on April 17th. He tried to rape this woman and what happened was she fought him off. And when the police came in, she gave a description of her attacker. She said that he had fresh stitches on his chin. So a young rookie cop went, a young rookie detective went and uh, and he looked at, he went to several hospitals and he tried to find who was the guy with the cable with the stitches on his chin. And they gave him a name. His name was Mateus Reyes. Mm -hmm. So they had his name already. It was just about time for him to catch him. So he committed that on the 17th. He committed the Central Park Jogging case on the 19th. And then he went on. And uh, 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 he wanted to rape and kill a pregnant woman, and um, and so this was the murder that he was looking they was looking uh, looking for him for. And um, when he finally got caught, he was leaving the scene of the crime, and he was trying to escape out of a building, and the doorman grabbed him. And so this is how they caught Mateus Reyes. And so when they interviewed him, um, you know, he never said anything about our case. He just confessed to the murder and the rape of Lourdes um, Gonzalez. And so uh, the same officers that conducted their investigation conducted ours. And so they knew who Mateus Reyes was. They was looking for him already. They had him on file. Now, logic should have told officers that if no DNA evidence came up in these five kids, maybe you should have tr tried somebody else, which Mateus Reyes would have been the perfect person to try. But they never did that because they were stuck and they were fixed on us. And so what happened is, so, uh, you know, Mateus Reyes winds up serving 33 years of life, right? And he's up in the, he's up in the, uh, he's up in Auburn Correctional Facility, and he bumps into Corey Wise, which is my co-defendant at the time. And Corey Wise is, at this time, he's in his 13th year. And um, him and Corey Wise meet each other in the yard, and he goes and he talks to Corey. He introduces himself, and he says, "Hey, you remember me? We was back in Rikers Island, which is a detention center in New York. We was back in Rikers Island back in 1989, and we had a we had a, uh, a disagreement over TV." And Corey told him, he says, look, don't worry about it. That was back then. This is now. It's not going to freak either one of us. Let's move on from it. And they engage in conversation. And what happens is Reyes says that the conversation they gave them, made, that they engaged in, made him feel so comfortable that he felt that he had to say something. Not to Corey, but to the authorities. Because he felt that he was a man who was serving 13 years of his life for a crime that he did not commit. And so he went on. And he spoke to the chaplain, and the chaplain went and, and they went up the ladder, ordered to the attorney general, and they called the district attorney's office, and they sent somebody to reinvestigate. So now, when they sent somebody to reinvestigate, they knew who Reyes was, but they didn't believe him. So they went and they tested his DNA sample. Now, the DNA sample matched. Patricia Miley had two, two samples on her. Well, she had one sample, but it was in two places. One was inside of her, and one was on the side. So they tested both samples. Both of them came back to match Reyes. So they knew that he did the crime. So now, they want to know where we involved with it. Now, we never knew Reyes. We never met Reyes. Reyes was a loner. He was a sociopath. And so Reyes went on to tell him, no, I committed this crime alone. And they still didn't believe him. So they said, well, how do we know that? How can we be so sure? And he went on to solve four unsolved cases for him. That they went back and reinvestigated and found out that he did these crimes. So now he was credible. And so we went back and forth to court for about a year with that. And it wasn't until the DA's office came back and they said, you know what, they did a full investigation and they released a 58-page document. And now within this document, 
it talked about all the faults within our kinks. And um, besides the DNA sample of Reyes that, that, that connected him to the case, there was also a brick that was used that they said had blood on it for the jogger. Now when they retested that blood, there was no blood on it. Um, our clothes samples, we had you know, so many hair fibers on our clothes sample, and when that was retested, it came to be that our clothes were laid down in the precinct. Now, we have police hairs on our clothes, so that was contaminated evidence, and you couldn't use that either. We had no ID, no person to ID us in any type of crime. And so because of that, you know, the, uh, the DA's office moved to vacate our convictions. And so in, um, in 2002, our convictions were vacated, and um, we, they dropped all our charges. And so uh, we went ahead and filed a civil lawsuit against uh, the city of New York in 2003. And that's, that civil lawsuit is still pending to this day. It's going on almost 10 years now. And, um, and the reason why it's gone so long is because the, uh, the DA's office, I'm mean, not the DA's office, sorry, but the, the, the Corporation Council of New York like to play these stall tactic games. And what they'll do is they'll send you all these waivers and have you sign them, which takes so long to get this, uh, to get the, uh, the, the, the information that they're looking for. And, um, and so they've been stalling our case for over 10 years now. And, um, and so currently, currently now, you know, in, 2000 and, in 2003, we met this young woman by the name of Sarah Burns. And Sarah Burns was an intern. She was working out our lawyer's office. And, and she asked us to write a paper. And we was like, fine, you know, there's no harm in that. You can write a paper. And she wound up writing a paper. Uh, and the paper was based about our case, but with the media presence in our case. And she uncovered a lot of the facts. And she became so intrigued and so outraged with our case that she went on to write a book. And she came for, you know, she asked, could she write a book? And we said, fine, let's write a book. So she went and wrote a book. And um, it was halfway through that book that one day she called us and said, you know what, my dad wants to do a movie about you guys. And we said, well, who's your dad? And she says, Ken Burns. And I'm like, well, who's Ken Burns? I don't know who Ken Burns is. Um, and, you know, just come to find out that Ken Burns is considered, like, you know, a massive documentarian. And, um, and so we met Ken Burns, and, and we wound up putting together a, a, a beautiful documentary that is out now. Um, and it's been, we have taken it to Toronto, Montreal, Chicago, San Francisco. Um, we have been to numerous film festivals, sold out crowds, and, and, and it's a beautiful response. And, um, is that out now or is it? Well, it will be out. It will be out uh, the 23rd of this month. The 23rd of this month. So that's something also that you guys can check out. Um, that can uh, 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 give you a whole different perspective because the five of us are in this movie, and, um, and it's a great thing. And people always ask us, you know, what do you do now? And you know, like me, and like I said earlier, we go out and speak to a lot of kids. Um, and the reason why I do it is because. Back in 1990, I was 14 years old. And because of this case, nobody wanted to invest their time into us. They, they literally, you know, didn't care what happened to us. They, you know, it was like good riddance. Some, there were articles that were written about us, you know, that used this Jim Crow type of language that said that, you know, if they took the oldest, the eldest of us, of the Central Park Five, and took them to Central Park and hung them by a tree, then it would be fine. And so, uh, uh, and so for me, coming here to see you guys is, is very therapeutic for me. It's, 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 it's an honor to be here amongst you because you guys are my future. And so if I don't come here and uh, 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 speak to you and invest my time in you, then who else will? And so this is the reason why I come here and talk to you today. And it's definitely been an honor, even though we was late. But at least you guys, I'm happy that you guys stuck around and was able to, um, you know, uh, uh, engage in dialogue with us because I know you guys got a lot of questions, you know. Um, and so I guess you know, if you guys got questions, let's do it. Have you met the uh, the woman that was uh, you were accused of um, assaulting? Well, what happened was that well, during the time of Patricia Manning ordeal, she became um, she became best friends with like the prosecutor and, and a lot of the detectives. And so here you have a 13 to 15 year period where somebody's constantly telling you that we're guilty. And then now, out the blue, you know, the, 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 the role has changed. And so um, she has become invested in that lie. 
And so that's not something that we want to push, you know, to, you know, to meet her and, and, um, and uh, uh, engage in dialogue with her. But if, if she ever wanted to, then we would be open the door. Yes? For death row cases, um, everyone who's on death row except for the state of Alabama actually is appointed counsel. Now the problem um, with death row cases, especially a lot of attorneys just want to, you know, stop. Like they're, they want to pretty much hold the, ex the execution date, you know? It's kind of a freeze. You don't want your client executed, you know? Um, so for our work, we usually don't work on uh, uh, death cases, although there have been 18 death DNA exonerations. We actually, a uh, month ago actually, exonerated a guy named Damon Thibodeau, who was the 300th DNA exonerator, who spent 16 years on death row for a crime he didn't do before the DNA came back through his innocence. So we pushed for it. The only problem with death cases is that, you know, like say you actually DNA matches your client who's on death row, that could speed up the execution date, you know? And so there's those consequences too of actually figuring out, do you want the DNA test or do you not, you know? You may be able to get them out somewhat, or you, you know, because there's a lot of different consequences of it. And that actually shows the consequences of DNA, too. Do the DNA tests really take that long, or is it just a lot of paperwork to get it all started? Yes. What hap uh, the, really, the length of time, a DNA test may take anywhere from three to six months to actually complete when, it's sent to the, when the evidence is sent to the lab. For our work, it could take years, only because, one, we have to actually find the evidence, and what we're dealing with, you know, even Raymond's case says in the 90s, right? We have cases in the 90s, but we have cases that go back to the 1960s, 70s, 80s, you know? These people have been in, you know, 20, 30 years when they were convicted. And so the problem is, like, we have to go back to the police department. Did they store the evidence properly? Where is it at? 22% um, of the cases, we actually can't find the evidence or it's destroyed. So that, and then even, we, sometimes we actually have cases where it took us years, actually, to locate the evidence. Um, so those are the, and then the problem also is like in, um, once we find the evidence, you know, we have to actually convince, because it's the state who has the actual right to the evidence, um, we have to either convince a prosecutor to either grant the testing, and half the cases we actually, they're say fine, you know, a lot of them actually think that our clients are guilty anyways, and so they'll be like, it doesn't matter, you know, you can test it. But in the other cases where they, they think they're really guilty and they don't want to waste the time, we didn't have to file, you know, um, a DNA testing motion in court, and then it could, I mean, it's gone in, sometimes it's been six or seven years before we actually got the DNA test um, done, or, you know, but we'll fight to the end usually, you know, because pretty much once we, you know, we believe every, if anyone is innocent and the DNA is going to really show it, you know, they should, they should have just a DNA test to show it. I get you. Um, we were looking at videos of this case today in one of my classes, and we saw that there were two other muggings in Central Park that night. Um, were there any convictions of those crimes? And um, if so, were they like also false convictions, or were they were those people actually guilty? Well, um, in, in our case, there were several other convictions. We were just the five that was convicted of the rape of Patricia Mondi. There was also another five or six guys that was convicted for robberies, for assaults, um, for muggings. And so, uh, 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 but those guys have come to depositions and have testified that we had nothing to do with that, that that was just them, that that was their doing, because the group was so large that at times, you know, one group could be one place, another group could be somewhere else. Yeah. I have two questions in one. Um, with, what do your, what do your um, fellow, um, the guys that you had, were accused of doing the um, crime with do now? And do you expect with them to win this civil suit against the city? Um, well, currently, like, Antoine McCray, he, he, lives out, he lives out of state. He lives in Atlanta. Um, Yusuf, Yusuf works at a hospital. Uh, uh, I, I work for a pension and benefits company. Kevin works at a hospital. And Corey is on disability. He's on SSI. Um, but uh, 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 but do we intend to win this case? Of course we do. You know, um, you know. I mean, we came this far, and we have truth on our side. You know, so you can't beat the truth at the end of the day. 
Because I imagine uh, DNA tests are expensive, so how is the project funded? Yes, uh, DNA tests can cost anywhere probably from $2,000 to $10,000, depending on you know how much evidence you're testing. We're funded actually half of our, 45 to 50% of our money comes from individual donations actually. So anywhere from $1, you know, to large donations, you know, up to a million dollars actually, so people who are rich have money. Um, that's half our money. We have private, um, we have private foundations. We have, we accept no government money actually. Um, so most of it's private foundations, individual giving is the largest part of actual government. Going into like the jurisdiction aspect, how much opposition do y'all face going into like recovering crimes and whatnot? Yeah, that would depend on actually where we're going. Like, and actually the, the part of our work, we work nationwide, so we go all around the country. And you know, a lot of times when we actually take the cases, you know, if we're going to Texas or the South, the Deep South could be the toughest. You know, you go in a small town, you know, and you, you I mean, it's a, it's a different type of law down there. You know, they have their own local justice kind of thing. You know, the sheriffs and the prosecutors are different, and the judges, they know each other, that kind of thing. So it really depends on the jurisdiction. In New York, it's pretty easy. You know, um, actually, it's somewhere in Dallas County, it depends on the prosecutor. Some prosecutor office actually now set up these conviction DNA units. Because it's like, you know, I think, every, you know, the thing with our work is that, you know, people can understand, actually, you know, no one really wants innocent people in prison, you know? And so they can understand that now. So there's more public behind actually efforts that even prosecutors now can believe it. But I think in some places there still is, you know, belief even on false confessions, even on misidentification that those, you know, that they still use those practices and they still believe in it, you know? And so we still have to educate people about that too, even in these jurisdictions that it could occur. Um, how is your family during your conviction and prison time? Were they, um, did they believe in your innocence or was it kind of a struggle for you? being 14 years old and in jail? In the beginning, um, first of all, I, I came from a big family. Um, I had five uncles on my mother's side, and I had three uncles on my father's side. And, um, and, uh, uh, and in the beginning, they all thought I was guilty. And so none of them, you know, none of them helped to bail me out, nothing. I didn't get no letters from them, anything. Only person that was actually in my corner consistently was my dad. He was the only one. Um, and so, you know, I was bitter about that for a long time. And, and as I got older and I got exonerated, you know, I, I was able to come across my family members and, and some of them apologized. And, and, you know, time heals all wounds and I was able to forgive them, you know. Yes? Has there been any cases where somebody had been on death row and they did actually get killed, but then they found out? Yes, that's a very good question, and actually, it actually has not happened yet. And one of the problems, I think, of death row and finding, and I mean, there have been innocent people executed, you know. I mean, it just tells by, you know, um, the people who have actually been um, exonerated before reaching execu for execution date. I mean, we actually had a couple of people who were five days from their execution date, you know, who were later exonerated by DNA, just because they had a lucky stay of execution, you know, before later going to test. The problem is, is after someone's actually executed, um, pretty much the case ends, you know? You don't really, it's actually extremely tough to actually to go back into court and to say we have a right to get that evidence when the person's not here anymore. Um, so that's really the problem. I mean, we at the Innocence Project call for moratorium on a death penalty until we can, you know, stop executing innocent people or we know how many ex innocent people have been executed, you know, and they're corrected, but we, there hasn't yet been a case. I think we're always, you know, looking for that kind of thing, you know, to really show that innocent people have been executed. I mean, people, I mean, we figure to happen. Uh, in the cases you take on where uh, after DNA testing, you find that the person is actually guilty, um, what steps do you take after that? Um, after the DNA actually matches them? Yes. Usually we just close the case. Um, it's a weird thing, though. I mean, and, you know, like I was saying, you know, if we actually get the evidence and send it to a lab, it's usually a 50-50 kind of proposition. You know, 50 of the time it's going to prove they didn't do it, 50% of the time it's going to prove they did it. You know, um, you know, we'll take cases even when the facts are extremely bad. And I think when you look on our website, just like the, the clip that was up there, and you look through all the DNA exonerations, the 301 that are on our website, you'll see that there's a lot of bad facts against a lot of them, you know? And I think that's why people are convicted, you know? We, and even when we see cases, a lot of times, you know, I'm on the um, 
investigating the cases, we see a lot of facts against someone. Maybe they had the goods or they were around the time of the crime, you know? And so pretty much because of that, we're going to take whatever, if the DNA is going to prove it, we'll take it, you know? Um, sometimes we also have people lie to us, you know? Some people, and that's the thing, because they'll say, we won't take a case unless someone says they're innocent. You know, so even the case where they, the DNA comes back and it's dumb, you know, it's pretty much because they lied to us and said they were innocent and weren't. But people, you know, some people, even guilty people in prison are desperate, you know, and they, so a lot of times people just think there's going to be some lucky thing. You know, I mean, the sad thing is, and we tell them from the start, the DNA, you know, everyone has a unique DNA and it's not going to be some, like, luck thing, you know, but people will take their shot in it. Yes. How did you end up working for Instance Project, and do you have to be a lawyer to do it? You, yeah. <laughs> uh, you do not. I'm not a lawyer. Um, we do have six lawyers on the staff, but we have actually um, different aspects of our work. You know, we have the we have intake aspect, which is the investigation of the cases. That's what I do. Um, and the research into the cases, pretty much, you know, have to go through the trial transcripts, the police reports, uncover alternate perpetrators, and, you know, maybe see how we can actually you know, come up with the theories for the, um, for exonerations. Um, we have the staff attorneys, and we have a clinic with law students who work on uncovering the evidence and filing the motions. We have a policy team. Policy team, you know, usually comes from different backgrounds, you know, research. Um, and we have a research department, too. And development, all the other aspects. So you, I mean, it, it, it's helpful to have a law background, but I mean, you can come. It's really just an interest in criminal justice work, an interest, to, you know, in, um, fighting wrongs, you know, and wrongful incarceration. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, this is more so personal to you, so feel free not to answer. But was there something that you saw or experienced in jail that really took a um, mental toll on you that you feel like experiencing? Um, for me, there was one point where, um, when my mom's passed away, um, I was about 19 at the time, and, and I was heading for the parole board. And, um, and she died from cancer, and um, and and that took. A, I was in college at the time because I, I also uh, got my associates while I was in prison, and so that took a toll on me for, for for you know for about maybe a good month. You know where I didn't I didn't get my hair done, I, I didn't get it cut, I didn't shower, my classes were failing, and um, and the counselor had to sit me down and he said, you know. Uh, you know, Ray, you gotta, you gotta snap out of this because this isn't you. And I didn't want to hear it. And he said, can I make a suggestion for you? And he said, write your mom's a letter and tell her everything that you never told her before. And, and hopefully you'll, you'll get some healing from it. And, and you know, I walked away and I was like, yeah, whatever, I didn't want to hear it from him. And one night I was locked in my cell and I thought about that. And, um, and that's what I did. I pulled out a pad and I wrote her like this 50 page letter. And, um, and, and after that, I began to heal, because I, I got everything out that I wanted to say. And, and it's funny that you even ask me that, because today is my mother's uh, birthday. And so, uh, and so <laughs> yeah, and so, uh, uh, and so uh, you know, now I have all this family that's all across the United States, and we're all on Facebook, so we post stuff about my mom's uh, you know, today. So, thank you. Um, we talked about um, having to defend yourself while in jail. So the thing that I wanted to ask you were, was, um, so let's say if you said it takes six to eight months for the DNA. So let's say the person is innocent, but while you all are trying to get the DNA, a big problem happens while they're in jail. Do they? Does that affect their ability to get released from jail because they're innocent, or will they be held longer because they had conflict while you all are trying to get them released? Well, for me, for me, uh, when uh, uh, like for instance for Corey. For Corey, Corey, um, Corey, uh, he wasn't going to the parole boards. He was refusing parole boards, and um, and what happened was he wound up getting into this argument with a correctional officer, and the correctional officer told him, he said, "I know who you are. You know, you're, you're that guy from that raped the woman in Central Park." And he said, "You're gonna see me again. I'm gonna kill you." He told him that. And so uh, when when uh, when when during the investigation, um, as it got close to the decision, uh, my lawyer was able to pull Corey out out of prison so that nothing can happen to him. And they put him on type of, like, some type of supervised parole for like two or three months until, until the case was overturned just because of that. They didn't want nothing to happen to him. But, yeah, and I think, you know, especially the people who apply to us, because prison is so violent, mm -hmm. anything can happen anytime. I mean, we've had a lot of cases where people, you know, are, are being injured in prison or beaten up, you know, some have to go to the hospital in between it. 
So we you know, have to fix, help with that. Usually for our work, we try to help through those kind of situations, um, and especially when someone's wrongfully has been in prison, you know, say even you know, anywhere five to 30 something years for something they didn't do. Um, we can try to work around, I think, a lot of times we try to work around whatever is going on, even if there are going to be some charges and they're going to get up and, you know, you know, assault or some other charges or drugs or whatever, small prison crimes maybe they're going to be charged with. We can try to work, or usually try to work around that, you know, and try to say that, you know, the wrongful conviction is going to outweigh, you know, that. And you have other arguments that you shouldn't even be in here in the first place. Yeah. No problem. Um, yeah. When you were 14 and, like, um, I know. You know, uh, uh, I get asked that question a lot, and, and I really don't have no answer for that. Um, I just knew that certain things for me were out of the question. You know, like I wasn't, I didn't uh, think about suicide, and, 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 and I knew that, you know, I was going to leave prison the way I came in, fully intact. And, um, and so, what motivated me? I have no idea. I just knew that I had to move forward, and, 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 um, and I couldn't let nothing stop me. You know, and so I, I you know, I, I give it up to God at the end of the day that I survived it. You know, but as far as motivating factors, I have no idea. I really don't. Yes. Um, just out of curiosity, have you ever, like, your organization ever helped someone guilty out of somehow? Um, you mean just like to get them out? Like they. <laughs> yeah, we haven't. Um, you know, I mean, that's not. Yeah, it's nothing. I mean, yeah, it's, it, we have nothing that has ever come up in any of our cases. You know, I mean, usually because you know the crime labs, like they're never going to like you know produce any result that's going to be like that. You know, and the prosecutor has very interest in having you know upholding it. I mean, they're you know overseeing everything anyway. So. Yes. Ray, you, you mentioned that you work, you have a job in yes. the world of pension benefits. Did someone take a chance on you? Because you do have a record outside of this exoneration, um, and you had that name from the past that's yeah. questionable, you know, for people who have businesses and such. How did you get the job like that? Well, you know, somebody did take, you're right, somebody did take a chance on me. Somebody knew my history, they knew that I was exonerated, they knew that um, I didn't commit that crime. But they also knew me as a person because before that I worked. I was a personal trainer, and I also managed the gym. And so the person knew me from the gym, and she knew me for about three or four years. And so her knowing who I really was, you know, she she took a chance on me. And I've been there now for like almost two years. Yeah. And you know, going off that question too is one of the problems of our work is you know compensation is you know someone even when you have a wrongful conviction, you know. You're still treated just you know, just like anyone else, you yeah. know, who's been in prison. Sometimes you can't get it off your record, you can't get it expunged. And so when you go, or some works out, they're going for job interviews, they have to bring, you know, the, the, the actual court papers or like a press release from the newspaper article, you know, when you still have to maybe fill out, you know, the line on your job interview, were you ever convicted of a crime? Um, you know, we work in 20, only 27 states actually still have compensation laws, um, and only half of our exonerees actually have ever been compensated. So it's still a real problem out there. Yes. Yes. I know that some injuries happen, but we were 14 years old in Central Park. At what time did they get the answer? 10 p.m., 11 p.m., and what parent can do to prevent that to happen? Because 14 years old, we get eyes at Central Park. What we can do to our kids? To that um, you know, I always say like parents is the first step, you know, to, to prevention. You know, parents educate themselves on the law, on policies and procedures with police, because our parents didn't have that because they never had a record, they never had any real dealings with the police, so they didn't know, you know, not to tell the kid to be quiet or 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 to get a lawyer. You know, some of them didn't even understand what Miranda rights were. And so I always say that it always starts with the parents. The parents need to know first. Because us as kids, who's our first role model? Our dad and our moms. This is the people who we learn from. And so it becomes easier for you to tell your kids. 
you know, and for you to school them on it, and so that they know how to, especially in New York City, you know, you have Stop Your Frisk now, which, which you know, is responsible for over 750,000 Stop Your Frisk. And so all that is in criminals. We know that. We know that a lot of those people in that Stop Your Frisk are hard workers just like you and me. And so it's all about us educating ourselves. That's number one. That's where, it's, that's where it starts. Well, no, because well, well yeah, yeah. If, if you would have, if, if, if we had, we had known that, and I would have said, stop, I'm not going to say nothing until you give me a lawyer, then that changes everything. Because they can't force you to talk, you know. And, and originally, you know, in, in the beginning, you know, when you go into a situation like that, you know, you say, I didn't do nothing wrong, you know, um, I have nothing to hide. That's your first response. And they know this already. And this is what they play on. In Corey Wise's situation, uh, they was looking for Yusef Salam. And Corey and Yusuf are best friends. And they was going up to Yusef's house. And the police was in the hallway. And he stopped them and said, they had a list. And they pulled out this list. And they said, what's your name? He said, Yusuf Salam. They said, oh yeah, you're on the list. And they checked them off. They said, we need you to come down downtown with us. And they asked Corey, he said, what is your name? He said, my name is Corey Wise. And they looked on the list. And they said, no. You're not on the list, but um, if you want, you can come down with your buddy. You'll be right back. You know, we're going to come down there, question your buddy, and then you have to come back together. Corey didn't come back to 13 and a half years later. Yes? Yes, I usually, um, for civil suits, um, we don't handle the civil suits, but we you know, sometimes give them advice or you know, other lawyers who could do that. For, we have social workers actually on staff, so whenever we actually have, you know, right when there are clients, um, if there are needs in prison, just like we were talking earlier, you know, we may actually, we've gone down actually and had social workers help them while they're in prison before we've even exonerated them. And any time the D, when we know there's exoneration coming up for our clients, we try to, you know, make sure we know their family members right away, their contacts in society, and our social workers, you know, you know, pretty much work on all that so that when they're out of prison, you know, especially within the first couple of years, we provide them with money, sometimes housing, sometimes we try to find them a job if we can find them. Um, the first couple of years is usually the toughest, you know, when they get out. Um, for a lot of our clients, we actually do are able to find them housing. Um, and it also really depends on how much family um, and friends they usually have. Some people have none, some people have a big social network, and that's really the key for how someone's going to adjust into society. So a lot, and the luckily thing about our, because we provide this thing, we're, we're able to provide money too, and we do fundraising just for the exonerees too, and the people we get out, just so we can provide them with those kind of services. I mean, it is a long order, you know, for them, and it's a tough road for a lot of them too. I'll tell you what, maybe one more question, and then, because we'll, people I know have to go, if people want to keep talking, perhaps you'll come down. Um, also, uh, remember that Remy was the one who got this thing started. It's great that students oh, yeah. generate these kind of programs. But maybe one more question, I know there's one down here. Yes. Um, you weren't read your Miranda rights, correct? Uh, the, like, I was. You were? But I didn't understand them. Okay. You know? <laughs> they were right over my head. <laughs> because, you know, when you walk into a situation like that, you, you start to feel the pressure immediately. Okay. You know, like, why am I here? Like, what's going on? You know, and, and, and so that's something that they play on. They know that. You know, unless you've been through that situation before, you have no experience of it. Then it's easier to pull over on you. Maybe, let, let's cut it this way. You, I know you have a pressing one. Quick. Uh, uh, are there any plans for the project to extend beyond uh, cases? For us, um, not at the moment, only because, you know, we have, you know, 10,000 cases we're even really doing an investigation on, just for DNA alone. Um, there are other projects, every, all, the, all the other 55 innocence projects around the country, usually at law schools and clinics, they do non-DNA and DNA. 
Um, but there, I mean, there's thousands and thousands of you know innocent people in prison. That's one of the problems. You know, we have our staff. We only have five people actually investigating the cases. You know, we have to go all around the country to all the states and to do the investigation work to go through all the you know the trials and everything from the background. It takes it's a large undertaking. But hopefully, there's other people, and I think that's one thing for the future is more projects that come up to do the non-DNA work and just wrongful convictions in general. I want to thank them, and I want to mention that uh, you guys are young. For those of us who are a little older, you can't imagine how big the Central Park Jogger case was. It infused the news, daily news, for days, weeks on end. It was an enormously powerful case that had resonated with people. People were really angry. I mean, there was a woman, half dead, raped in ditch, and there were guys, these guys were out, quote, wilding. Yeah. Young, wild guys. And the implication is that black and Hispanic kids in the city are running wild and they'll come in your neighborhood, who knows what. I mean, it was a real fear. And it was an enormous case. Just ask your parents. Um, and to have Ray Santana here in one piece, doing well, a, a good man, as you can see. As good, you can see it. Um, it makes you feel good about something here. Um, I'm sorry I had to go through all that, but let's thank him for coming out. <laughs> Thank you also for having us here to talk. I mean, you know. Uh, also, you can check on our website, www.innocenceproject.org. There's a lot of things also. We had, we had a youth campaign years ago, you know, because 33% of the people actually um, exonerated were between the ages of 14 and 21. Um, and also, you know, the things, there's a whole thing on our site about what you can do, you know, um, just from the, even the bottom level, and, you know, going to our Facebook page or other, or our website and checking out and feeds on, on this. Cause, Exonerations and people wrongful convictions will continue. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we are such part five is on Facebook also. Well, we have some lawyers to be in this crowd. Maybe they'll yeah. put in some time with the Innocence Project one day. Thank you. Right. Okay. <laughs>